Good evening, everyone. Welcome to CSIS. I'm Dr. Kathleen Hicks. I direct the International Security Program here, and I also have the honor of overseeing the Smart Women, Smart Power Program. Um, thanks for joining us here, those of you who are live here at CSIS, and of course those who are online via our webcast. We're very honored today to have former Under Secretary of State for Political Affairs, Wendy Sherman. Um, she's going to be here for a great conversation with Nina. Uh, be sure also, if you're not already, to be following us on Twitter for this and all conversations we do. We are at Smart Women. And check out our Smart Women podcast and our Smart Women iTunes U course, which Apple named one of the best of 2015. I also want to especially thank City for supporting the Smart Women, Smart Power initiative, which seeks to amplify the voices of women in foreign policy, national security, and international business. And with that, please welcome Candy Wolf, who's the Executive Vice President and Head of Global, Global excuse me, Government Affairs at City. Candy. Thank you. Welcome, everyone. Um, and I want to thank you all for joining us. This is our third, I think I'm right, right? It's the third in our series this year um, for Smart Women, Smart Powers. And uh, we've been proud to be a sponsor both last year and this year of this great uh, uh, series because it's really a chance to highlight all of the talented and exceptional women leaders. And today will be no exception. Uh, and we're thrilled to have uh, Ambassador Sherman here with us today. Uh, Dr. Hicks is going to introduce the ambassador, but in her roles as uh, in both the Clinton and the Obama administration, she's dealt with a number of foreign policy hotspots and national security issues. And at Citi, as the U.S.'s most global bank, um, we've had a front row seat in the work of the State Department uh, and its challenging responsibilities. Sometimes we're in the hot seat with them. Um, <laughs> sometimes we need help to get out of the hot seat. Um, but certainly, you know, we recognize in, this, uh, in the world of geopolitical risks uh, the impact that these geopolitical issues can have on our franchise, on our employees, on the markets, and certainly on our customers. And so whether it's from issues involving North Korea or Iran, um, you know, we tend to be front and center, and some of that's around some of the sanctions debates where many of these issues require the banks to implement the policies going forward. So um, we greatly appreciate the role and support that state has provided in supporting all of us and U.S. businesses around the globe in the work that the ambassador does. And I look forward to the conversation that Nina's going to have with the ambassador, and I thank you again for joining us. Okay, before we, first of all, thank you to Candy and again to City. Before we begin the program, um, I do just want to remind everyone of the exits that we have here. There are two at the back and two at the front. If we go that way, there is a bar and a church, as I like to say, depending on what caused us to pull the alarm, we'll go to one or the other. Maybe they're in sequence. Um, uh, uh, and, and I will be your safety officer to direct you in the right direction. Uh, now, we're very pleased to have Ambassador Sherman with us tonight to discuss her career in diplomacy and politics. She has been the lead negotiator on the Iran nuclear deal and played a key role in the negotiations surrounding North Korea's nuclear program. She is currently senior counsel at the Albright Stonebridge Group, a firm she helped to found between her tours at the State Department. As always, our moderator is CSIS Senior Associate Nina Easton, who is also chair of Fortune's Most Powerful Women International Summit and the co-chair of the Fortune Global Forum. Today we have cards available for asking questions. Um, if you would like to ask a question, please write it down on the card. We will pick it up and uh, we'll pass those to Nina um, for, for the moderated discussion later. So with that, I turn it over to Nina. Thank you. Um, I'm going to break ranks here a little bit. The podium, I think people probably can't see Wendy oh, because of the podium. Are we going to move that? Okay. Excellent. Thank you. Well, thank you all for being here. Um, Pre-holiday weekend, we are so thrilled to have the woman that's been at the center of truly of uh, history this past year. And uh, we're delighted to have you here, Ambassador. Thank you, very good to be with you. So um, before we get started in talking about this history-making year, I wanted to talk a little bit about your life because you just gave a back-to-back -back commencement speeches uh, and you called it an unexpected life, which is exactly what I thought in knowing you all these years mm -hmm. and then going back and revisiting um, your biography, 
because you've been, uh, as Kath said, you've been everything from the, state, the upper ranks of the State Department in the 1990s under Clinton. Um, you've been at the table with North Korea. You've been at the top of the State Department now, of course, and your, your role with the Iranian deal. Um, you were CEO of Fannie Mae. I mean, you've had this extraordinary move into these various parts of, your, of, of this high-level career, but you actually started as a social worker. Mm -hmm. And you met your wonderful husband, Bruce Stokes, um, by, uh, by your shared passion about uh, low-income urbanites. Mm -hmm. And that's really where you're, you were going. In fact, when I met you, you were with Emily's List, and you're working for Senator Mikulski. You're in, you're in politics. Mm -hmm. So talk to us about how you your career path and how that happened. Well, thank you. First of all, it was wonderful to be here with you all today. And I want to thank Kath, who I've known for a long time and is really just an extraordinary public servant and now a uh, scholar here at CSIS. And always great to work with you. And I want to thank Candy Wolf for city support uh, for this effort. Uh, when I came out of the Clinton administration, I actually worked as a consultant for Citigroup for a year. Uh, trying to help city think about its um, uh, really how it was dealing with the community, its corporate social responsibility, and how it did its thinking about its banking world in a way that would work over the long term and be sustainable. And it was a terrific experience. Bob Rubin was there at the time, and he was really the person who helped to make that happen. And Nina uh, Easton and I have known each other for a very long time through all kinds of changes in our lives. And so it's a special treat to be here Likewise. with such a noted journalist and uh, businesswoman. Um, I have indeed had an incredibly unexpected life. Um, and um, it was my message to all of the graduates um, oh, last week, which by the way, shaking hands at the commencement gave me this wonderful cold, so please bear with me. Um, I said to all of them, and I would say to particularly the young people out here, of which there are many, everybody is a young person at this point in my life, but is um, not to have a five-year plan, uh, to be ready for the wonderful things that life has in front of you, uh, I did indeed start out as a social worker. I have a master's in social work and community organizing. It taught me a set of core skills mm -hmm. about how to survey the environment, how to bring a group of people together to work for a common cause, how to um, reach objectives uh, when it looks like you can't possibly get there, uh, to build a team, uh, which has been critical in everything mm -hmm. I've done in life. It's never about an individual ever. Even if it looks like it is, it never is. Um, it taught me to understand the, other, the person on the other side of the table, mm. what their interests were. And I've taken those core skills, and I only half-jokingly say, my caseload has changed. Mm. Uh, I started with individuals. I was the director of child welfare in the state of Maryland and worked in protective services and adoption and foster care. Mm. Uh, then I went into politics through a very strange process, which we can get into or not. Get into uh, that briefly. Uh, get into yeah, it yeah, briefly. Yeah. I was working um, for USC's Public Affairs Center here in Washington on community-based strategies, actually out in Pittsburgh, California, your uh, home territory. So and USC, the, USC the, the school. The school. Don't we have people from USC here? Yes. Yes. Trojans, go. You, tro you, had, you have a public policy center here in Washington, and I was working for it, working on a grant that looked at community services in Pittsfield, California, in Hyattsville, Maryland. And I was teaching public policy to undergraduates. And um, the dean of the school at the time, Art Napperstack, who has unfortunately since passed away, uh, was very good friends with a congresswoman named Barbara Mikulski. Hmm. And uh, then Congresswoman Mikulski was trying to figure out how to finance centers for battered women. Hmm. And I had some ideas about how to do that. So he introduced us. We became very good friends. We were both from Baltimore, but hadn't really known each other. We knew of each other. We were both social workers. And um, she then needed a new chief of staff. And we joked around uh, one night, maybe I should do that, because I'd always wanted to come to Washington. And I did it. Uh, I uh, went to Washington and became 
Um, at, by that point, I was the director of child welfare in Maryland. Uh, and I um, went to Washington, was her chief of staff. Then I got married, became a mother, decided after three years as her chief of staff, I needed a different life uh, to be able to have some time. Uh, you can have everything, it's just hard to have it all perfectly all at once. You never have it perfectly, but it's hard to have it all at once. So I left um, for a year, but then got dragooned back in to running her gonna, campaign yeah. for the U.S. Yeah. Senate. I was going to say, it's uh, not exactly like you went for a calm life after No, that. I didn't go, go for yeah, a calm yeah. life. I went away for a year, worked at a foundation in Columbia, Maryland, and, uh, but then got asked to run her campaign for the U.S. Senate, which I did. She was successful, which was one of the great moments of my life to help the first Democratic woman elected in her own right to get to the Senate. Uh, but I had told her I wouldn't go back to the Senate because I didn't want that kind of a life with a small child. Um, that didn't turn out exactly to be how things worked out. Um, mm -hmm. I didn't go back to the Senate, but I got very engaged in politics. I ended up uh, going back to Maryland politics for a while, but quickly um, came back and helped Michael Dukakis try to become president, which didn't work out so well. Uh, we're on, ran Emily's list, um, got involved in um, Democratic politics, became a partner in a Democratic media consulting firm, uh, and then one night got a call from a guy I knew out of politics named Tom Donilon, who was going to become many years later the National Security Advisor, but then he was just you know, Tom a political Donilon. guy, a Tom Donilon, a lawyer, and it uh, turned out one of the other partners at O'Melveny, whom he didn't really know because he was located in California, Warren Christopher, was going to become Secretary of State. And Tom said, uh, Christopher would like to meet you. I said, really? He said, yes. Can you come see him tomorrow morning? <laughs> so I went and met Warren Christopher on Martin Luther King's birthday. And Christopher said to me, uh, we'd like you to think about, the President would like you to think about, if we can get agreement, that you become the Assistant Secretary for um, Legislative Affairs for the State Department. And I said, well, if you want someone who knows everything there is to know about national security, I'm probably not the right person. Mm -hmm. And as I told students, never be who you aren't. Uh, but if you want someone who knows something about that, because I'd done a lot of campaigns, you sort of have to know that. And as you know, my husband was a journalist wrote about international trade and economics, so we talked about this stuff all the time, but does know a lot about Washington, maybe I'm the right person. And that's what I did. I became the assistant secretary, confirmed by the Senate, and I continue to do national security and foreign policy ever since. As someone not specifically <coughs> educated in foreign affairs, mm -hmm. because I mean, you have a lot of, I'm sure, graduate students here um, who are on that mm -hmm. track, did you ever feel out of your league? Absolutely. What did you do then? How did you make up for that? Um, I am very fortunate. I have a, uh, I'm a very quick study. I have a very good short-term memory. I have a completely horrific long-term memory, <laughs> um, which may be good because things you are unhappy about, you forget about faster. <laughs> um, so it really makes you understand that you need a team, that you have to rely on expertise. Uh, and you have to understand what you're good at and what you're not good at and bring people together to get the job done. I didn't know what I was doing when I became Barbara Mikulski's chief of staff when she was a congresswoman. For several days, people kept talking about dear colleagues. I had no idea what, she, what they were talking <laughs> about. What did they mean, dear colleagues? I felt like an idiot. Uh, I was the chief of staff. I didn't know what a dear colleague was. Did, were you careful not to let your ignorance about things well, show, the, or did for, you? Well, at the beginning, I didn't, because uh, I was the chief of staff. I thought, well, how can I not know? And then I finally understood a dear colleague was a letter that the congresswoman wanted to circulate to her colleagues to get them to get on an issue that she was interested in, and every letter began, dear colleague. <laughs> That's what a dear colleague was. So. Um, you know, after a while, I began letting people know what I did and didn't know and was very straightforward about it. And I was younger then. As a more mature person, I was very quick to let people know what I did not know. Yeah, well, you didn't know. So, yes. so to flash forward here, yes. um, 
during the Iranian talks, um, you were described as an iron fist in a velvet glove, mm -hmm. a badass, and then there's this Iranian cartoon that portrayed, as, they, as this is a description of you, silver-haired, stern, as a fox. Mm -hmm. So your staff started calling you the silver fox, mm -hmm. and you had t-shirts made mm -hmm. up. So, so you just bought right into that. Sure. That, that worked for you. You know, um, doing any of these negotiations, doing any of these jobs that some of us are privileged to be able to do. Uh, and I was really privileged to have President Obama and Secretary Clinton uh, and then Secretary Kerry asked me to continue as the Undersecretary for Political Affairs. It's an extraordinary job. You're responsible for every region of the world. And because you're the political director of the United States government, you end up being a negotiator in many circumstances. And the P5 plus 1 plus the European Union plus Iran negotiations that are talked about were done at the political director level day in and day out. And then, of course, they didn't get done without the Secretary of State uh, and without Secretary Moniz, Secretary of Energy, and the President of the United States and the other leaders uh, in the group. So um, I got uh, to do that. And um, it's, it's incredibly wearing and exhausting. Um, people, uh, the last part of that negotiation, I spent 27 days in the Palais Coburg in Vienna I left for exactly one meal outside of that wow. hotel. Uh, and so it's really stressful. So in the five or 10 minutes that you have, you know, where you're waiting for a meeting to start or another meeting has to take place before you can have a meeting, people find things they can do to sort of relax a little bit. Uh, and so uh, my team, which was fantastic, um, one of the team's kids back home made each of us sock puppets mm -hmm. and sent them along with cookies to Vienna, which was great, were greatly appreciated. Uh, the team decided someday there might be a movie called The Coburg Affair. So they started to cast us all. <laughs> um, I think this story has been told before, but maybe not. Um, so We um, hope not. We hope this right, is the first so, time. Right, yeah. uh, so Secretary Kerry would be played by Ted Danson, because the hair. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would be Meryl Streep in Devil Wears Prada, because oh. of the hair. There you go. Um, uh, Secretary Moniz would be Javier Bardem uh, from um, uh, No Country of Old Men, where his hair yes. is very similar <laughs> to Ernie's. Um, you know, and so forth and so on. Jake Sullivan uh, was going to be Colin McCaukin. <laughs> so we, you know, you have to do these things, or you just go or you go crazy. You so go like, what we, this is usually at three in the morning. At th yeah, when yeah. you're really yeah. losing it. So, yeah. describe an average day during one of those twenty-seven days. <sighs> or is it just a blur now? It's it's. In there is no such thing. It is there was um, no, average, no such thing as an average day. As an Every, average day. Um, uh, the day starts, um, pretty much everybody ate breakfast in their room. And the Austrian government was extraordinary. They paid for all of our meals. They had a buffet at lunch and a buffet at dinner. Um, and I'll come to that in a minute. So uh, after a very, very, very early breakfast, um, I would have a very, very early team meeting. Um, uh, I had um, assistants uh, who brought me materials I needed to see before I had that meeting, including any intelligence I might need to see overnight. In the two hours that you were sleeping, you mean? When Something you like overnight. that. Yeah. Um, and then we'd have a team meeting, and everybody sat around the table. It didn't matter what your job was, whether you were an administrative <laughs> assistant or you were uh, our nuclear physicist. Uh, you sat at the table so everybody knew what was going on. There were a few things not everybody could know, but for the most part, everybody did. And then there would be a variety of meetings. You know, I, I joke about the Iran negotiation. People think of it as a sitting in this room, the pictures you saw of Secretary mm -hmm. Kerry yeah. on TV. And certainly there were those meetings, but the Iran negotiation was a series of negotiations. We'd negotiate inside the U.S. government. Then we'd negotiate with each of our partners bilaterally. <laughs> Uh, then we'd negotiate with other partners and allies around the world who had interests. We'd negotiate with the U.S. Congress. 
uh, we'd negotiate among the P5 plus one. Yeah, and that was and, difficult. I and mean, that, that was difficult. That, that, I mean, you, you had to create unity among this group Absolutely. where, you know, the Chinese and Russians weren't exactly on the same page as exactly. the U.S. And, and the U.K. and France were often wanted to be more hardline than the U.S. Well, I don't know about that. At least they no? wanted okay. to appear that way. Okay. And uh, <laughs> then occasionally we did negotiate with Iran. So it was occasionally, a, a, you know, it was it was a constant set of round robin negotiations all the time. And then in the negotiation room with Iran. So let's talk about Iran. What did you, what lesson did you take away on how to negotiate with an adversary? Hmm. A potentially, you know, <coughs> like a, a, a semi-hostile adversary. Yeah, well, you know, early on in this negotiations, um, uh, we all had to deal with death to America and death to Wendy Sherman on the streets of Iran. Death by to name. John, by name. Uh, so yes, it was a very difficult, very adversarial situation. Uh, we don't share the same objectives in the world. We did all at the table agree, however, that Iran should never obtain a nuclear weapon. Uh, and the President of the United States was very clear what we had to achieve to ensure that was the case. And all of the P5 plus one partners in the European Union shared that objective. So even when difficult things like Ukraine happened, everybody did stay focused on the inside the negotiation That's room, which is very hard to do, very hard to do. Um, Iran, uh, the Iranians are extraordinarily good negotiators. They are very tough. Um, what's their style? Are we, like, give what's their inside. style? Their style is to, be, to know every single detail, backwards and forwards, uh, to be very aggressive, uh, to be very unforgiving. Um, uh, Unforgiving if you... If they're, you. Very, they're very tough. They're very hard line. Um, we were equally hard line, so you could have some very difficult uh, discussions, sometimes screaming and yelling. We tried to minimize the screaming and yelling. Give me an example of something that caused you to scream and yell, mm. where you just got fed up. Towards the end of the negotiation, um, we were all without sleep. And when you don't have any sleep, um, the last few days in Lausanne, the last few days in uh, Vienna, uh, we were operating on one or two hours of sleep a night. When you're operating on that little sleep, you have to be very, very, very aware of yourself because it's very easy to lose it. Uh, and you can't because you're at the end of a negotiating sequence, which is exactly the point at which you cannot lose it yeah. because you've got to hold the lines you must hold. Right. Uh, and you cannot blink. Uh, and uh, one of the last pieces of the negotiation um, uh, was very difficult. It was the UN Security Council resolution. And we had gone past the uh, deadline uh, that we hope to ensure being able to have 30 days for the US Congress to review it. Mm -hmm before they went out for August recess. So tremendous pressure was Tremendous on pressure. And it became clear we were not going to make it, that we were going to go past that July deadline. Uh, and I had plans. I had announced I was leaving the government. Hmm. Uh, and I was going to Harvard as a fellow starting in September. And it became clear to me that plan was out the window, yeah. not happening. And I was really pissed off. Uh, and uh, my Iranian counterparts were being very tough. And Would I, you say obstinate <clears throat> or tough? I'm very difficult. And I uh, got very angry uh, because I was negotiating that because the US holds the pen on Iran resolutions at the UN Security Council. And I actually, when I get angry, um, since we're among largely women, love you guys, married one now for 36 <laughs> years, love you guys. But when I get angry, I cry. There's nothing I can do about it. I just cry. And I have to explain to people, these tears are not because I'm weak. These tears are because I'm really pissed off. Interesting, yeah. So I got so angry, I started to cry. They were completely rattled. Oh, that's <laughs> Uh, 
Um, I know there's some journalists here. I just assume that story not up here, but, um, uh, but it had a really good effect. That's really. Uh, and we got it done. Uh, so uh, we got. We what did got they? What I mean, what was their reaction? What did they do? Just and and it was just four of us at that point in the room. Um, my two counterparts and uh, Rob Malley from the White House. Uh, and even Rob, I think, was like, wasn't sure what he was supposed to do with me. <laughs> uh, so, uh, but um, it got us to closure. It helped get us to closure. So, you know, I think um, you use what you have available yeah. to you <laughs> uh, to try to get things done. And we, I just, again, going back, because we kind of got off track, but, yes, but what sorry. lessons did you learn from dealing with the Iranians? What, lessons about the art think, of negotiation. I think you have to be very, very clear about what you're trying to achieve. And I was very lucky because the president was incredibly clear. Uh, and the right and left margins were very clear and very firm. And you have to know what those right and left margins are so that you know where your trade space is and where your trade space isn't. Um, I learned that in a negotiation that, this is, that is this technical and this complex, you really, really have to learn it all. Mm. I am not a nuclear physicist. I, am. Uh, <laughs> I don't hope to be, never want to be. But I had the experts sit with me and go through every line of everything and every detail. If I couldn't understand it, I wasn't going to be able to explain it and defend it. Uh, and so I had to learn it all. You have to learn it all. The content matters. Uh, so you have to have the team, you have to have the content, you have to have the courage to go for it and not back away from what is necessary. You have to understand that timing matters. The clock matters and sometimes the clock is with you and sometimes, as I just explained, it's not and you have to make the best use of it. For two years, the P5 plus one, the European Union and Iran ran around the world when Ahmadinejad was the president and Saeed Jalili was the nego lead negotiator. Uh, uh, Lady Ashton, uh, Baroness Ashton, was the EU's high representative, and she led us all around the world to no end. Hmm. Uh, we were even in Baghdad in the middle of a sandstorm, hmm. uh, where all of the delegations came in on U.S. planes for security reasons. We all met in Amman, and they all, even Russians and Chinese, came in on U.S. planes into the green zone. Uh, and we got nowhere, but what that did accomplish was to create a very tight bond among the P5 plus one in the European Union, because we'd run all around the world together, accomplishing not very much of anything, because the timing was not right. And then when Iran held its election and Rouhani became president and we had our uh, secret channel uh, had begun, uh, we got a sense that there might be some traction and timing made it possible. It didn't mean it would happen, but it meant it was possible. So you have to have courage, you have to have competence, and you have to have the clock on your side. So and then there are lots and lots of other pieces. Then I have to ask you, um, since you brought up timing, <coughs> the, um, the now infamous uh, story in the New York Times Magazine about Ben Rhodes, uh, who said that, in fact, that they used Rouhani's election as president at a moderate coming in um, at, to say, as part of the narrative, to say that this, is, this was an opening for us, when in fact the negotiation and, and the talks had started a couple years before. What's your well, perspective Well, no, they hadn't started that? a couple years before. The, the P5 plus one process was very open. That had started before. In fact, there had been negotiations going on with first the E3, and then it became the P5 plus one for many, many years. Uh, and some people believe that had the Europeans uh, taken what's called the TRR deal, the Tehran Research Reactor deal, uh, some years earlier, uh, we wouldn't have been in the pickle that we were in. That deal didn't come to pass, but we went in the early 2000s from Iran having 164 centrifuges to the time we were negotiating when they had 19,000 yeah. centrifuges. So uh, timing makes a difference in the negative as well. Uh, you should make a deal when you, you can to right. get the best advantage. And I think 
the world wasn't ready to do what was necessary when it was at 164, but we would have been in a far better place than when we were negotiating 19,000 centrifuges. Uh, I think, you know, the, uh, the clarity I want to give about what went on in this process is it was, I think, one of the most, if not the most, transparent processes that have ever taken place for such a complex negotiation. We literally held hundreds, literally hundreds, well over 200 briefings with the U.S. Congress, mm -hmm. both secure and non-secure. Uh, we, um, of course, had a very public process after the deal where every single detail of this deal was public, every single detail. And there was an incredibly robust discussion throughout our country, throughout the Congress, that was very hard fought. Uh, so there was nothing uh, that was not above board here in this debate. Uh, and I think um, you've heard from some of the uh, NGOs, some of the think tanks, some of the scholars who fought very aggressively on both sides of this. So I don't think anything was other than the robust debate one should have on something so consequential. So, and this brings up the question of the various factions within Iran. Did you come to, in your mind, really understand what was going on behind that dark screen? And, and just kind of explain to us what, what you did learn. I think uh, Iran remains a pretty opaque society, uh, but I learned a few things. I tend to talk about hardliners and hard hardliners. Hmm. When we use the word moderates, it means something to us, which is hmm. not what it means in hmm. Iran. Hmm. Uh, and um, President Rouhani is a conservative cleric. Mm -hmm. He is a supporter of uh, the supreme leader. Uh, and for us not to understand that would be naive on our part. Uh, he certainly is trying to move to a more open economy. Whether it moves to a more open society, we do not know the answer to. More than half of Iran's population is under the age of 30. Mm -hmm. Even though there is censorship, uh, profound censorship, and lack of access, through a lot of hard work, including some by the US government, young people in Iran do have access to the web. They have access to CNN. They have access to Al Jazeera. They see what's happening in the world. And they want to be part of that world. They don't want to be isolated. So whether change comes in the way that we all hope to Iran, I think, is an open question. Hmm. Uh, but Iran will certainly have a more open economy. And that is a positive thing, I believe, because I believe that when business enters an economy and comes with Western business practices, uh, things change for the better. So going back just a little bit during the negotiations, because we had some um, interesting conversations in the green room <laughs> about the, we talked about, you talked about the dealing <coughs> with an adversary and the negotiating tactics, but there's also, a, you know, you have to kind of listen to them and, and see their needs. And at one point, you brought out a whiteboard, so explain mm -hmm. why you did that. And also mm -hmm. talk about, um, there are a couple of human moments sure. in all of this. So um, the Iranians did not want paper early on in this negotiation, in part because in a society where uh, things are very formalistic, they are in ours too, but we have a little bit more space, uh, everything has to be reported back. Uh, and so it's very hard to have a discussion without paper. So um, even though we live in a very high-tech world, I grew up in a low-tech world. Uh, and so I asked my team to find an enormous, you know, sort of uh, whiteboard, an old chalk chalkboard, but a whiteboard, uh, and uh, sat with uh, Iranian counterparts and put every element up on the whiteboard you know, I can print mm -hmm. pretty well. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, we went through each one of them, where they were, where we were. And we, of course, all took copious notes. Right. Right? But it wasn't formally. But it wasn't formally presented. And uh, then I took all of those elements and put them, we put them on a piece of paper. And Secretary Kerry then was able to carry that around and knew that we had to address everything. And the reason. Uh, to the press that I talked about the Rubik's Cube all the time was because 
all of the pieces had to fit together in order to achieve, for instance, the one-year breakout time that was required to make sure we would have time to know if Iran didn't fulfill uh, what they had said they were going to do and were moving towards a nuclear weapon. Um, if you moved one technical element, it affected another technical hmm. element. So all the elements had to fit together, and when the press would say to me, well, do you give it a 95% chance or a 50% chance, I would say it's binary. We're either going to get there or we're not going to get there. You can get to that last 1%, and if the last piece doesn't click in, you don't have a deal. Hmm. So um, the secretary having this visually on a piece of paper, he understood all of the pieces that would have to come together. So that whiteboard then became used by the technical experts because they could then put equations up on the whiteboard, erase them, they'd have no standing, uh, but the Iranians could put up their calculations and they'd have no standing. Uh, and even our Very European smart. colleagues would be able to do that as well with each other because we all use different assumptions right. in the technical uh, equations. Um, on the human side, um, Abbas Arachi, who is the lead deputy for Minister Zarif, um, and I both became grandparents during the negotiation. Uh, and so we would share, thank God for um, iPhones um, and videos, uh, because we could share videos of our grandchildren. Secretary Kerry share, shared videos of his grandchildren as well. Um, and it made it a human moment, to be sure. Uh, but then we'd go right back in the negotiating room and be very tough on each other. Uh, so it didn't transfer, and it didn't, it didn't stop our understanding what our responsibilities were as professionals. Mm -hmm. uh, but it probably did at least uh, make us understand each other in a slightly different way. And the dining rooms? The dining rooms. So at the Palais Coburg, uh, there were two different dining rooms uh, because ours had alcohol. Uh, and <laughs> which, trust me, was great. You needed. Um, uh, and um, the Iranian dining room did not. Um, but as we got to know each other and as the negotiation went on, Minister Zarif, who is a very um, entertaining and uh, hospitable person from time to time, um, would invite us, some of us into the dining room, and their food was great. Uh, it was a Persian caterer and um, pistachio chicken. Ooh, Persian that chicken, good. just really terrific. So, so flashing forward a little bit more, um, you know, of course, there's the critics uh, of the deal um, have had more fodder handed to them, I think, since when the um, the sanctions were lifted, of course, mm -hmm. in January, um, and yet the Iran continues its activities in Syria, and more troubling are these ballistic missile tests. Mm -hmm. What do you say to that? What I say to that, and I was actually in Israel at the time that implementation happened and the same weekend that uh, most of our American citizens returned home, though we're still hoping as soon as possible that we enable Robert Levinson to come home, for his family to know what happened to him. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so it was an interesting place to be at that moment. Yeah. And what I've said to my Israeli colleagues, uh, whom I talk to constantly during this negotiation, and to Gulf uh, Arab colleagues and other colleagues around the world, is imagine how much worse everything would be if Iran had a nuclear weapon. If Iran had a nuclear weapon, it could project even more power into the region, and it could deter our actions. So this deal was meant to ensure Iran never obtained a nuclear weapon, which was essential. Nobody disagrees with that. And all of our sanctions remain on ballistic missiles, on terror, on human rights. Uh, and we will enforce them and are enforcing them. Uh, and what I said to my Israeli colleagues, I was at the Institute for National Security Studies conference, so there were 1,500 people I could speak to. Uh, and said that we need to come together in a concerted strategy to deal with the terrible things that Iran does in the region and throughout the world and its support for Hezbollah and Hamas. Uh, and we all have to be together on that and work very hard 
uh, to ensure Israel's security, the security of our other partners in the region and around the world. And that is an ongoing and very tough and very necessary enterprise. So I'm sure the audience will have a lot more questions on Iran, but let's um, go backwards, uh, because this wasn't the first time you were at the table with an mm -hmm. adversary talking about weapons. Talk about the North Korea talks of the 90s and compare it to this. So the agreed framework, which was the agreement with Iran, was reached by Ambassador Bob Gallucci, who's a terrific diplomat, was the dean of the uh, School of Foreign Service here at Georgetown for a while, uh, now teaches there. Um, and I was the Assistant Secretary for Legislative Affairs and had to make sure the Congress would support it. Uh, so that was my job then. Towards the end of the Clinton administration, when I came back as Madeleine Albright's counselor, however, I worked first with uh, former Secretary of Defense William Perry, and then uh, I was going to say took his place, but no one can take his place, uh, but became, after he did, the President's um, Special Representative and Advisor on North Korea and negotiated with the North Koreans, went with Secretary Albright on her historic trip to Pyongyang. And what we were trying to negotiate at that point was for them to stop testing missiles. And the reason was at that point, uh, North Korea had no nuclear weapons. They had enough plutonium for one or two nuclear weapons, but had not built a weapon and had not weaponized and not, had not turned that plutonium into a bomb. And we thought if we could stop them from testing missiles, they would not be able to advance their missiles and they would not have a delivery system for any nuclear weapon. Uh, and we got, I think, close, but we will never know uh, because uh, the administration came to the end. You all may recall we had a rather difficult election. November came, we didn't know who was president. December came, we didn't know who was president. Uh, and finally, in December, uh, the Supreme Court decided that George Bush would become president. And so there really wasn't time to finish that negotiation or transfer it to the next administration in an appropriate and proper way. Uh, and then President Bush had other ideas about how he wanted to proceed. And you've more recently had some um, provocative words about North Korea that we're going to talk about. But we, if people who have questions, um, I guess you raise your card and we will happily come pick them up and ask the ambassador. Um, you were just here mm -hmm. a month earlier this month mm -hmm. arguing that um, the key countries uh, around or that care about North Korea, which of course means us as well, uh, need to be thinking about unexpected scenarios like a sudden regime collapse or coup. Explain that. That's pretty <coughs> alarming. Yeah, well, I think the North Korean threat is pretty alarming, actually. Yeah. I think it's one of the most difficult challenges faced now by President Obama and certainly will be faced by uh, whoever is the next President of the United States. You all can probably guess who my candidate is. But, um, and you're formally advising Hillary Clinton, yes, we should point I'm out. Yes, I'm a yeah. surrogate for her, yes. So um, uh, I think it is a terribly dangerous threat because North Korea now has more than one nuclear weapon, mm -hmm. multiple nuclear weapons, uh, building a delivery system for that nuclear weapon, uh, and is a threat not only to the region, but to the world. Uh, and this young leader, Kim Jong-un, uh, is um, totally in control. We saw that in the party congress that just took place 36 years after the last party congress. Uh, and um, he is a pretty terrifying individual mm -hmm. from my perspective. Uh, and what I said in these remarks is that I believe the sanctions resolution that was passed by the UN Security Council unanimously uh, is very important. It is very important to enforce it. We will probably need additional sanctions on North Korea. Uh, I believe that China's enforcement of those sanctions is critical. And China holds more economic leverage on North Korea than we do, just as we held tremendous economic leverage on Iran. Mm -hmm. uh, China really is the one who holds the economic card with North Korea. Is China doing enough? China is doing more than it did, uh, as the president just said, uh, from Asia. Uh, but China needs to do more. And I think there is a concern on China's behalf that if it ratchets up the pressure, that there could be a collapse or there could be a coup. 
And I'm not saying we should create it, but we should prepare for it. Uh, because if we're not prepared for it, then North Korea knows it has leverage, not only over China, but over everybody because people will be fearful of what will happen. Ha so we need to prepare for it. We need consultations with our partners, okay. which we are doing. I was gonna ask you. We need consultations with Japan, with South Korea, with China, with Russia, with others uh, in the region, in the world, to think about, well, what would the peninsula look, look like afterwards? How would we secure the nuclear weapons? What would be the posture of our deployments of American troops? Uh, what would be at risk? Uh, what would we do with the migrants? What would be the economic costs and how would they be managed? How would we make sure the nuclear weapons that are there would be secured? There are a lot of questions. What are the possibilities on, on, on the, that question? How do you secure these nuclear weapons? Uh, there, there are ways to deal with all of these things. Uh, they're hard, uh, but uh, one can find solutions. You know, um, one of the great privileges I had was to also join Secretary Kerry with Minister Lavrov and my counterpart, Sergei Ryabkov, and a phenomenal team of technical people to negotiate the Syria CW agreement. And for a long time, nobody understood how the heck we were ever going to get the chemical weapons out of Syria. An opportunity presented itself. The president was wise to take it. Uh, and all of the chemical weapons got taken out of Syria. After years of people not imagining how that problem would ever be solved. So I assume, are we going to see candidate Hillary Clinton talking a lot about the dangers of North Korea? I think we've already heard her talk about the dangers a lot of more, North I Korea. Say I it's... think we've heard um, other conversation about sort of sitting down and having a chat with Kim Jong-un. It's a little more complicated than that. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, uh, but I think we'll be hearing a lot about North Korea, and we've just heard the president speak to it uh, on his Asia trip, uh, and glad that he did. Well, it's interesting you, you raise that, but, but you know, you don't sit down and have a chat with Kim Jong Un. But nevertheless, you saw an opening to negotiate with a bad guy. At what? But you don't see. Uh, look, I'm I'm not saying there will never be a time where there won't be a conversation. There was a conversation that was had with Kim Jong Il by right. Secretary Albright. Uh, but when uh, Kim Jong-il sent his envoy to the United States um, to uh, say that he would uh, welcome a conversation on the terms that we were interested in and brought a very interesting proposal to us, uh, he first wanted the President of the United States to come the following week. We said, well, it sort of doesn't work that way for us. We like to prepare a little bit. We want to prepare that conversation for the president so that it is productive. Uh, and they said, OK, uh, well, he can come the following week. We said, no, <laughs> it takes a little bit more time than that. And, and we negotiated the Secretary of State would come first. Uh, and they said, OK, well, she can come next week. We said, well, actually, you know, uh, we don't have an embassy in <laughs> North Korea. Um, we have a few things we have to work out. Yeah. Uh, but we came within two weeks, which was really extraordinarily uh, fast uh, for U.S. Marines to show up in Pyongyang. Uh, it was pretty amazing. So, but what is your overall philosophy on when you should reach out to bad guy, heavily armed bad guys? Uh, <laughs> I think every situation is sui generis. Uh, you know, I think uh, Secretary Clinton uh, was ready to talk to people when the time was right, the conditions were right, and it was going to be productive. That was certainly true for President Obama. Uh, he did so with Iran over a long period of time, and it didn't start with him. Uh, he uh, did that with Cuba, uh, but did not start with a conversation that the president had with Raul Castro. It started at different levels. There are ways to convey your interest if you see an opening, uh, which we did in a number of ways in both of those situations. Um, so I think you can open a channel, uh, but that channel uh, doesn't always start with a sit down face to face. You've had some personal experience being around Putin. What's your take on him? Um, 
another one of the great experiences I've been privileged to have, I guess, great experience, I'm not quite sure how to describe it, was to be with Secretary Kerry and our phenomenal ambassador to Moscow, John Teft, in the meeting in Sochi with Putin. Mm -hmm. uh, he's very smart. He's very capable. Um, he um, is tough. What makes him tick? Hard to know. Uh, I think everybody knows his background. Mm -hmm. That's ever present mm -hmm. in the room. KGB. Um, and um, he has humor. He can be self-deprecating, uh -huh. which I think people don't expect. Uh, he wants to, I think, uh, restore, in his view, the dignity and pride of uh, Russia. He'd like to restore the dignity and pride of the Soviet Union. That's not going to happen. Uh, but I think he is about uh, the greatness of his country. And every leader has pride in their country and their people, which I understand. Uh, but his economy at the moment is truly down the tubes. Uh, but his people, uh, the citizens of Russia, don't blame him for that disaster, which is rather astonishing. First of all, you guys are the most engaged audience I've ever seen. This is just so impressive. And I'm sorry we won't get um, to, to um, all of these. I'll try to kind of put as many together as I can. But thank you. I just want to say thank you for being so engaged. Um, we're going to start first. This always comes up, even though we, we, no matter how much we're sticking to geopolitical issues, a lot of women want to talk about work-life balance. Sure. Um, which role your husband played in your something, corner, yep. career, but then it also, I'm sorry? Career, career, career I'm yes. sorry, okay, yes. and then what advice um, you can share to young women that want a family and a stable job, how being a woman has impacted the decisions that you made? Make, sure. Make it short. <laughs> <laughs> it's many books, as you all know. Um, look, I do believe you can have it all, you cannot have it all at once the way you want it. You just can't. And it's very hard to do unless you have a great partner. I am lucky I have a great partner uh, because he was... He is a great guy. I know him. He's <laughs> fabulous. Um, because he was a journalist for many, many years and he often could write at home. It created some flexibility because I was, for the most part, not at home. Um, I have a wonderful, wonderful daughter um, who now has two little ones of her own and now I think she understands better when I tell her that when she, was, when she was two years old and about to turn three, I was running Senator Mikulski's campaign for the Senate. It was a crazy thing for me to do. It was insane. And I told Senator Mikulski I would only do it with a certain set of rules, and I urged people to make rules. The rules were that when it was time to put her to bed, that I would only go to evening events if it was crucial. Otherwise, I wouldn't put my daughter to bed that um, she could not call me during the bedtime time. Um, and there was no email then, so phones were the only option. Uh, she, I could talk to her later, but I couldn't talk to her during that window of time. Um, on when my daughter turned thir three, it was the Sunday before the primary, which was a very competitive primary against the sitting governor and a very popular congressman. I was feeling very guilty. I had 16 three-year-olds over to my house. That was nuts. <laughs> that was nuts anyways. It was nuts, it was nuts, period. Three, three, had 16 age three, three, olds, right? three children. It was That's nuts. I had a clown, which only scared <laughs> the kids, you know. It was nuts. And so I learned an important lesson, which is guilt never, a little bit of guilt never kills anyone. Uh, but doing things like that nearly killed me and her because I was a banshee. I was crazy. So um, I had great help. I promised that I wouldn't do this, but I'm going to anyway. You have to have great help wherever you work. The person who's with me today, I won't tell you who she is. You can figure it out. Has worked in and out of the private sector with me for 22 years now. I am very, 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 very fortunate. I know that every day. Uh, because you have to have people who help manage your life. I hope I help manage her life as well. And building those teams is critical. It's never about you, it's about the team. Great. So we're going back. Um, these are from our Trojans. Um, 
Well, these are really great questions, guys. I'm going to kind of try to put both of these together. That um, it, considering that three percent of the Iranian parliament is comprised of women, did you experience pushback during the negotiations due to your gender? And how did you kind of gain respect out of that? And then kind of related to that, um, how do you think the education of Iran's population, especially young women, will change the course of that country and its foreign policy? It's very, very interesting. Uh, the two people who probably spent more hours with the Iranians than anybody else um, were me. And the person who spent the very most time with the Iranians was a woman named Helga Schmidt who actually will be here in Washington tomorrow. Um, she uh, was the deputy to first Kathy Ashton and then Federica Mogherini, and she coordinated all of us, and she did many of the negotiations herself. Uh, so often, Abbas Arachi and Majid Ravanchi were opposite to women. Uh, and for me, I was three things. I was a woman, I was the great Satan, and I was Jewish. Uh, which they knew. We had a fascinating discussion that they were not the only men who, with whom I could never shake hands, uh, that I grew up uh, around in an Orthodox Jewish community, so I understood these traditions. It did make it difficult at times, and when I last saw them in New York, my last week as undersecretary at the UN General Assembly, and we were saying farewell, it was very hard not to be able to shake hands or even give a professional hug. It was very hard. Uh, so there was a lot of this. Uh, but I will say this, the majority of the journalists were women. Hmm. Uh, and they are very good uh, and very assertive. And uh, the women in Iran are very well educated. I think women will be more and more a power. In Iran, Minister Zarif uh, had his wife with him on several occasions. She's very sharp, very smart very capable, very learned uh, woman. Uh, so uh, I, I'll bet on the Iranian women. They are quite something. Great. Uh, changing subjects here a bit. Would you share some of your concerns regarding possible nuclear arms acquisition or escalation involving Japan and South Korea given re recent missile system advancements by North Korea? Yeah. Let me say one other thing about uh, the women thing, which is uh, important for those of you who want to be women diplomats. Madeleine Albright taught me a long time ago, so I want to give her credit, that when you sit at a table, you're less yourself than you are the United States of America. So when I sat at the table, I wasn't really Wendy Sherman. I was the United States of America. That's a lot of power. Well said. And if you use it well, uh, you can get pretty much anything done. So understand well that's said. quite critical. Yes. Um, uh, on uh, Japan and South Korea gaining nuclear weapons. Someone's shopping this idea that other countries should get nuclear weapons. I don't know who that would be. But it is a dangerous and reckless idea. Really dangerous and really reckless. And Japan and South Korea understand that. Uh, we do not need people with more nuclear weapons. We just spent years ensuring that Iran will not obtain a nuclear weapon. It is a crazy idea. It should not happen. It is dangerous. We must ensure that our allies and partners are secure. It is why uh, there is missile defense in Asia. It is why we are discussing the THAAD system with the ROK. Uh, I know that this makes China nervous. This is part of the whole discussion about how to make sure that Asia stay secure and that North Korea cannot threaten uh, its neighbors, in fact, would be a threat to China as well. Uh, that's why we have to have these very detailed consultations. Um, this is, again, from uh, combining a couple questions from our USC friends. Um, I'm from Southern California. That's the only reason I'm doing this, guys. Um, <laughs> We're here, but this is interesting, we're here studying nuclear <coughs> nonproliferation for six weeks, and yesterday we had the opportunity to sit in on the House Foreign mm. Affairs Committee hearing on the JCPOA. Many on the committee were frustrated with the Iranian human rights abuses that are higher than ever. Do you think the implementation of, of non-nuclear sanctions would lead to a breakdown of the agreement? And then let me add this second question. Isn't it time for the policy of behavior modification toward Iran be changed to one of supporting civil society, human rights, and free and fair election? Like, what, what can we kind of pressure? Uh, I think we do support human rights in Iran. Uh, we put out a human rights report every year. We are no holds barred on what we say about Iran. 
Uh, we have sanctions on human rights in Iran and many entities who are part of those human rights abuses in Iran. We speak out forcefully all of the time. Uh, we had uh, an ongoing uh, separate negotiation, uh, which I did every time I was there, which ultimately led to another negotiation interagency to get most of our American citizens back, and we will continue to work on this issue uh, because it is about people's lives. There is nothing more important. Uh, and um, uh, I think that we should continue to designate whatever entities we need under all of our human rights sanctions. We have gone to the Human Rights Council, the, the uh, UN General Assembly, and the UN Security Council has followed through on the human rights abuses in Iran. It is important for us to use the rapporteur that exists against human rights abuses in Iran. We have to use all of these vehicles. The US government uh, has done whatever it can to ensure internet access, which is very critical uh, for people in Iran to be able to mm -hmm. sure. access and talk. We have a virtual embassy on the internet so that we can uh, try to move uh, uh, an agenda forward. Uh, what we did say as part of the Iran negotiations is that we would not immediately uh, reimpose the sanctions that were lifted. And remember, they were lifted. They were not terminated. They will not be terminated for a considerable period of time um, uh, under another name, uh, just willy-nilly. Uh, but I can assure you that if Iran takes uh, truly horrific uh, terrorist action or truly horrific human rights action, uh, that people will respond. So even more horrific than what they do today. Today, yeah. Yes. Um, with the recent agreement with Iran, Americans have been promised that Iran will not gain access <coughs> to the U.S. financial system. However, and of course, uh, we also know that Tehran is complaining that it can't get, that the sanctions aren't really lifted mm -hmm. because of the limit, limitations mm -hmm. on using the dollar system. Mm -hmm. However, in an effort to reintegrate, that, to reintegrate that country back into the international system, U.S. leaders are encouraging American companies to invest in Iran. How can we help reintegrate Iran while keeping the American dollars safe? If you could well, of... actually, we aren't encouraging U.S. companies to because the U.S. still has a primary embargo uh, with uh, on Iran that goes back to 1979 and um, the hostages that were taken for so long. Uh, so we have a primary embargo. What we did in this agreement is do some carve-out through licenses and those carve-outs are on pistachios, uh, carpets, and caviar and uh, they are on... Um, Sounds like a nice picnic. I know. <laughs> uh, airplanes and airplane parts. And the reason we did airplanes is because the safety record for civilian air travel in Iran is horrible. People die all of the time. Uh, and so we permitted only for civilian use, and we have some ways to ensure this is only for civilian use, including these can't be sold to those airlines that are under sanctions. Uh, for what they do uh, on the military side. Um, uh, we created a carve out for those licenses. Uh, and there are some other, uh, there has never been an embargo on humanitarian goods. So pharmaceuticals and agricultural products can uh, be uh, transmitted to Iran. Uh, and the other thing we did is we said foreign subsidiaries of American companies can trade with Iran but no American officials can be involved. Hmm. So there are very, very narrow carve-outs. Uh, so most American companies cannot trade with Iran, uh, and dollars cannot be used. And we did not approve what's called the U-turn, which is uh, transactions coming through US banks and going back out again so that financial transactions are easier. Uh, but uh, there are still ways to finance deals. Um, there is still currency that Iran has in foreign banks all over the world, some of which were part of those famous frozen assets. Uh, and so what we have said is we are not going to stop anything from happening, uh, and we encourage people to move forward with trade where it's permitted. Um, if <coughs> the next president of the United States is not a Democrat, uh, there's been talk of an effort to uh, 
change or get rid of the Iranian deal. Can that be done? So Legally, what, what the, are the deal, legal? people have to remember, the deal is not between the United States and Iran. Right. The deal is between the United States, Iran, Russia, China, Great Britain, France, Germany, and the European Union, endorsed through a UN Security Council resolution that was endorsed unanimously by all 15 members of the UN Security Council. So it's a deal with the world. It's not just a deal with us. So if we decide, if the next president decides, which seems to me makes no sense if Iran is complying with the agreement, which is, of course, the first standard. Iran must be complying. If Iran is complying with the deal and they are not moving toward getting a nuclear weapon, why would we change that? Why would we change that? And if we choose to do so, you're going to have to get the Congress to agree, and the Democrats will have a vote, and some people think the Senate at least may change to democratic control. Uh, and the President of the United States is going to piss off a lot of our partners who want this deal to go forward and who will be trading with Iran. Well, we are getting the hook. Thank you so <laughs> much, though. This has been so insightful. I wish we could go on for another hour. Well, but thank you, Ambassador. Thank you, all. Thank you so much. Thank you.